I would like to welcome everybody um, to today's session, uh, the second part of our two part series. Um, and uh, looking at the regional uh, cross border trade toolkit. Those that were here last week, I would like to welcome you again. And thanks very much for attending this uh, week session, um, the second part. And I hope that uh, you had time to um, review the information that we shared and you probably have more probably questions. Have more questions. Um, uh, may I kindly ask uh, colleagues to mute because uh, I'm hearing myself. So yeah, please feel free to uh, post your questions in the chat box uh, or do raise your hand uh, when we are uh, doing or uh, the discussion session and uh, we can then attend to your questions. Um, my name is George Makore, uh, for those that uh, were not here last week, and I am the Deputy Chief of Party for the USAID Southern Africa Trade and Investment Hub. Uh, we call ourselves USA Trade Hub in short. Um, I'm uh, here to just um, uh, introduce a webinar and just highlight uh, or provide an overview of what the USAID trade up does. Um, so uh, on to that, we are a USAID funded project, uh, which has been in existence uh, since uh, October uh, 2016. So we are a, a six uh, year project and we are the project is due to end next year in September. And our role as a project, um, what we have been doing uh, since uh, we started, we are mainly here to work uh, with uh, entities across eight countries uh, to increase sustainability, uh, sustainability uh, on economic growth, uh, as well as uh, global export competitiveness. And uh, we have three main objectives or three main uh, target areas for our activities. Uh, and we mainly uh, work across eight countries in the SADAG region. Uh, the eight countries are led by South Africa, as shown on the map there. Um, and the four other SACO countries, that is Eswatini, Lesotho, Botswana, Namibia, as well as uh, three other countries, uh, that is uh, Mozambique, Malawi, and Zambia. So those are the eight countries that we cover uh, uh, as a project. And in those um, eight countries, uh, the one objective is looking at, uh, mainly looking at increasing exports from seven countries uh, that I've mentioned into South Africa. So the idea here is to identify areas of deficit in terms of uh, demand, uh, uh, required demand in South Africa or demand for products in South Africa. And then we um, identify potential suppliers in the seven countries uh, and then link them up with the buyers in South Africa. Uh, the idea really is to increase uh, trade between South Africa and the other seven uh, countries from the region. The uh, basis of, of, of this thinking is that South Africa has a large population and there's a, a, a always growing demand for different types of products, uh, which might not be uh, uh, satisfied uh, uh, internally in South Africa or locally. And also because South Africa is technologically advanced, uh, it uh, uh, produces uh, products uh, for uh, exports to other countries, including the United States. So they would always require raw materials. And that's the thinking behind our first objective. The second objective looks at um, all the eight countries that we work in, and uh, we try and um, help the, the companies in those countries 
to utilize or increase utilization of the African Growth and Opportunity Act, uh, which allows over 6,000 product lines to be exported uh, to the US without paying duty. Uh, so we help uh, companies, firms, uh, producers that uh, would require to access the US market. And we provide uh, support in different areas, including um, awareness creation on uh, US market end requirements, as well as uh, assisting uh, companies with uh, um, getting the required uh, certifications. Then um, the third objective uh, looks at um, those companies that would require um, capital and technology uh, to uh, help them with uh, uh, increasing production, helping them to meet the standards that are required. So what we then uh, do is we identify investors uh, or potential investors from South Africa who would be willing to extend their footprint into the region. And the thinking is that uh, South Africa is mainly the starting or the launchpad for most um, investors in the region who would want to um, first invest in South Africa, then uh, uh, grow their investments um, into uh, the region. Uh, we try and uh, assist with that in terms of linking up the investors uh, with potential investees. That's the work that we do um, as uh, uh, USAID, Southern Africa Trade and Investment Hub. And I think you can see how that all that dovetails uh, with the uh, reason why we are here today, uh, which is mainly aimed at uh, getting you uh, to understand the, the uh, how to navigate the export and trade uh, uh, um, uh, area uh, by understanding what tools you would need, how you can actually use those tools uh, to ease your uh, exports into South Africa and to the US. The, to the US. Next slide, please, uh, Mr. Peso. So um, with us today, uh, like we promised last week, we're going to have uh, Mary take us through the second part of uh, this webinar, mainly to explain more uh, technical uh, detail in uh, the uh, to, uh, regarding the tools that are, are often used uh, in trade, uh, so that you can actually have uh, a better understanding of those tools. And uh, helping me with that uh, is uh, again a. Uh, uh, who I introduced last week as our portfolio manager for Botswana, Malawi, and Namibia. She is going to be moderating uh, uh, this webinar again today. And uh, uh, for for those that have not uh, who do not know Frances, uh, she actually used to be the portfolio manager for for South Africa or for the South Africa cluster. And and, and Frances has been with uh, with the. Uh, USAID trade up uh, for quite some time now, and uh, she is uh, uh, quite uh, well versed in um, uh, the issues to do with uh, the subject of today. Um, but before I get to that, let me just look at who uh, we are expecting to be with us here. I indicated much earlier that we looking at over 100 participants. Um, as we uh, stand now, we have about four, uh, 70 participants, so we're not doing badly. And the breakdown, as you can see there, is we're looking at participants from Botswana, uh, Eswatini, in fact, all the eight countries that I said uh, much earlier on uh, that we cover. And uh, I would like to thank you all for taking this time to be here uh, with us, uh, especially uh, those that have, uh, were here last week and uh, uh, welcome back. And we really appreciate you being here for this very important webinar. So it, I, as I had already indicated, I will now hand you over uh, to Francis uh, to take us through the um, uh, webinar uh, uh, today 
and uh, as I highlighted earlier in the program that was shared, uh, after Francis, uh, we will have uh, a discussion session. Uh, so um, Fr Francis is going to introduce our, our presenter, uh, Mary Kaunda, who is going to take us through um, the webinar. And then after that, we'll have a discussion session and then uh, Sepiso will help us out with the next steps uh, before we conclude. We hope that uh, we will not uh, keep you longer than uh, uh, four. So this um, um, webinar is uh, uh, supposed to take about two hours um, and, and hopefully that uh, we will actually uh, stick to the time. With those words, uh, I would like to wish you very fruitful discussions and I now hand you over to Francis. Over to you, Francis. Thank you very much, George, and welcome everyone. I think the first thing I would like to just let you know is the session is being recorded. Um, normally we host these or post these on our website after the uh, webinar, so you will be able to go and look at this or refer people to this webinar at a later stage. Uh, just to be aware, we do do some small edits, so it does take us a few days or a week or so to actually upload um, the, the recording to the site, so you won't see it immediately. It will take a, a few days for it to appear. We will also share the presentation with you and the tool that uh, Mary will present. It's an Excel tool. Uh, we will share that with you afterwards as well uh, as a, a reference document. So um, don't worry to be scribbling down too many notes between the presentation and the recording. You should be, you should be covered. Um, just a reminder to please keep yourself on mute and to keep your video off unless you're speaking. And please feel free to pose questions in the chat box um, as we're going so that we can address those when we get to the discussion session. The plan is for us to have Mary present until just after three and then to allow for plenty of times for questions and answers and discussion. So um, we will have a bit more time than last week. And then uh, I think those are all of the housekeeping arrangements for for the session. So it leaves me with nothing else. But <coughs> having worked in a logistics company as well as can everyone still hear me yes uh francis but uh you're getting a bit faint okay sorry about that um my pandemic puppy decided to rip the wi-fi out of the wall um, but luckily i was on the other connection <laughs> So um, just to welcome Mary, she, Mary's been working with us, as I mentioned last time, for a few months to develop a, a toolkit and a guide that we can use as a reference document uh, in the coming months. And it gives me great pleasure to, to welcome Mary, who, who brings both academic as well as practical experience in this field. Um, there's a lot to be learned. I'm really looking forward to Mary's presentation today on some of the details of contracting, inco terms and payment. Thanks, Mary. Over to you. Thanks, Francis, and thank you to everyone who has taken the time to actually join us for this webinar. And I hope when you leave today, you actually go away with some really good information that you can use um, to start your trading or to continue your trading. Um, you know, and that's the point of these webinars um, and the regional cross-border trade toolkit. Um, last week, what we went through is what the toolkit was about and the types of information that you could find on the toolkit. Uh, this week, we are actually going through contracts, um, inco terms, how you choose them, and different payment methods. Um, so if I can just share my screen. So today, what we'll be looking at is contract, the formation of the contract, obligations of the seller, conformity of the goods, obligations of the buyer, remedies for breach of contract, and passing of risk. 
Um, thereafter, we'll look at Incoterms and we'll do an introduction to Incoterms, select, how to select an Incoterm and the different payment methods. Sorry, guys. Just, I just want to switch off my video. Okay, when you're starting off with a contract, um, if you have had any dealings with buying internationally, even if you've ordered something from South Africa or you've ordered something from China or something that you've just ordered online, you'll find that there is no real contract. And um, there's no written contract. It's not like when you buy a house or if you buy a car where you are sitting with documents that you go through and you, you know, you end up having to sign it. Uh, and read the terms of, and conditions. When you are dealing with an international sale and making an offer, your offer is actually your advertisement. Um, it's an email that you may send out. And this offer is basically you telling to your, telling your potential customers, um, this is the product I have and this is the price that I want to sell it at. So if you're selling a fridge and you say, okay, the fridge is $500, that is you making an offer of a sale, okay? So that is where your contract starts. So if you have advertised that you are selling a fridge at $500, um, you put the offer out there. So you cannot actually take that offer back. Um, you can only revoke that offer or take an offer back is if you have actually sent that um change before the offer was advertised so if you've ad wanted to advertise with the newspaper or if you are advertising on a web page so before that advert is actually posted and you decide okay you want to take it back you would have to take it back before someone actually sees the offer um so even if you walk into a store today and on the shelves uh, you're looking to buy a ton of coffee and there's a price on that 10, which is much lower than you would normally pay. So let's just say you pay $10 and today it's $5. Ultimately, if that price is on that shelf and specifically with the price for that coffee, the shop has to give it to you at that price because they've made an offer to sell it to you at that price. Now, that is where your contract starts. Your contract starts with making an offer um, revoking an offer, you would have to do it before the offer is actually advertised, before it's literally out there for someone to actually see it or somebody to say, I want to take up that offer. An acceptance of an offer is when someone comes back to you from looking at your advertisement, from looking at your email to say, I'm accepting your offer and I want to purchase. So if you're selling 100 t-shirts at $2 each or $10 each, um, they can say, okay, I, I really want those that 100 t-shirts and I'm willing to pay $10 each, okay? Or they can say, you know what, I'm not happy with that offer. When they come back with a rejection to say, I'm not happy with the offer or my answer is no, that is an, a rejection of your offer. If they come back and say, okay, um, I like the t-shirts, I see that you're selling it at $10, but I don't want to pay $10, I'm gonna buy down to pay $8. That is actually a rejection of your offer. Okay, so when you're sending out an offer, you can also send it out with a period of time for acceptance of the offer. Now, remember when you're selling any product, now your prices will change. It will depend on how you're sourcing your um, materials to make a t-shirt, how you're sourcing your raw materials to make any product for that matter. Um, and if the raw material price changes, so does the price of your product. If there's anything that changes within your production, your price will also change. So if the raw material price goes down, the price of your t-shirts may also go down, or if it goes up, then the price of your t-shirt will go up. So that is why you need to have a period of time for acceptance. So if you say, um, you know, I'm selling these t-shirts at $8, but it is only valid for the next seven days. So counting from today, this offer is only valid for seven days. So if you want to take up that offer, you would have to take it up within those seven days. Now, the most important part about this formation of the contract and making the offer is knowing the product that you're selling, 
um, knowing the quantity that you want to sell and knowing the price at which you want to sell it at. Because I could tell you, okay, I'm selling the fridge and the normal price is $500, but to, for the next seven days, I want to sell it at $200, but I may only have 10 fridges. So I need to state that while stocks last, or this is the number of fridges that I have, because I don't want 20 people coming to me and wanting to buy that fridge, or, but I only have 10. And now if I don't have the additional 10, I would actually need to go and purchase them and I might actually make a loss from selling it at that price. So these are the things that you need to think about when you're forming the contract and your formation of the contract doesn't happen specifically on writing down a contract. It happens a lot of the times, especially with international business on email. So you need to be very careful about what you state on email. You need to know exactly um, you know, the specifications of what you're offering to somebody. You need to give them as much information as possible. You need to say, okay, this is what I'm offering. I'm offering 100 t-shirts at $8 each. The offer is valid till, till the end of March. And, you know, this is the color of the t-shirt. And this is how long it'll take for delivery. Um, and that's one of the things that you need to consider when you're forming the contract is your delivery time. How long will it take to get to the ultimate buyer? So this is just the formation of the contract part. Then you're moving on to the obligations of the seller. So if you decide, okay, if you are selling 100 t-shirts, it's going to be $8 each. So that's $800 that somebody would have to pay you for those t-shirts. Um, and someone has agreed. So I'm in South Africa and I've decided, okay, um, you are in Zambia and I actually want to buy those t-shirts. Um, and I know the quality of t-shirts from Zambia are good. And, um, you know, I'm happy to purchase that specific t-shirt. It's a blue v-neck t-shirt. Um, it's something I can sell in my store. So I contact you and I say, I want to purchase the t-shirt. And you are happy to sell it to me. But what is the next step? The next step is actually starting to look at how much will it cost to deliver the goods to me? Um, who's going to pay for all of that? Um, what is your obligations as the seller? So your obligations is to deliver the goods. But where do we deliver the goods? Um, do we deliver in Zambia? Am I going to get somebody to pick it up? Are we going to deliver it at one of the borders in between South Africa and Zambia? Or are you going to do it to my business place here in Durban? Um, so ultimately, we are going to go back and forth deciding how to do this. How do we go about deciding where we deliver, how we deliver? Is it coming by truck? Are you going to air freight it to me? Um, the cost that it entails is that, I mean, truck would might be cheaper than air freight, but air freight is a lot faster. So we will actually have to go through all of these questions with each other. And that's how we actually continue with our contract. We go back and forth and then we uh, start answering the questions that I may have and that you may have. Then you would have to hand over any documents related to the goods. Um, then we have to question, when do we have to hand over the documents? What are the documents that you need to hand over? Now, the basic documents would be your um, commercial invoice, your packing list, and any transport documents, okay? Um, and then if you are clearing it on your side, then obviously your bill of entry or bill of exit from your country, uh, whatever customs documents that you've handed over. So whatever information you can give me, that is what you need to provide with me. Anything related to the goods that will help me clear it here in South Africa. Um, you need to transfer the property and the goods and transfer of the property. Now, your transfer document or your bill of lading usually acts as your title to the goods. We won't go fully into details about bill of ladings, but whoever's name is on the bill of lading and whoever holds the bill of lading literally owns the property in the goods. So if you sent me the bill of lading and the cargo has arrived in South Africa. I own the goods. Whether or not I paid you, it doesn't matter. As long as I've got the document, I own the goods. 
Um, and we'll go a little more into detail um, when we're going through input terms about, you know, ownership of the goods and when risks and ownership pass. Um, then we have to look at the conformity of the goods. So yeah, I've got uh, fish, I've got uh, coffee, and I've got some packaging. Now, your goods must conform to the quantity that quantity that you've specified. So if you are a seller and you told me you're sending me 100 t-shirts, you need to make sure that there is exactly 100 t-shirts in the box or however you are sending it to me, you need to make sure that it's there. The quality, it has to be according to any, um, so if you've sent me any samples, the quality has to be the same. Um, the description of the goods has to be the same as what you have told me that you are sending me. So if you've told me you are sending me a specific blue v-neck t-shirt, that is what you need to send me. You cannot send me suddenly a black round neck t-shirt because that is not according to what we have contracted to because you have told me blue v-neck t-shirts, I'm expecting blue v-neck t-shirts. Um, and I've got my customers ready to purchase that. So you can't go and change the description. So that is why it's so important. As a seller, you need to know exactly what your product is. You need to be as specific as possible when you are speaking to the buyer about what you are offering them and, and how you are going to be packaging it. Okay, So the goods must be fit for purpose. Um, so if you are selling fish, okay, now, normally you would transport fish as frozen um, and it, you will need a refrigerated truck or even if it's by air freight, it has to be in a refrigerated container um, to make sure that it doesn't spoil on the way because I'm not purchasing spoiled fish. I want fish as fresh as possible. So the sooner you get the fresh fish frozen, the fresher it will be when it gets to me. Okay, so it must be fit for the purpose that you are selling it for. So if it's fish and I need to eat the fish, it needs to be fit for that purpose. If it's coffee, it needs to be fit for that purpose. Now, with South Africa, if you are sending coffee, you cannot have any additives to the coffee because that's when we will have a problem with it. So it needs to possess the same quality as the sample or model that you've sent. There cannot be any um, move away from what you've sent told me the quality will be. Um, and especially with agricultural products, these are usually measured. So I could send it to a lab and say, please test for you know, how much of protein is in this um, soya, um, soya beans. So these are the things that we would have to go through. So if you are not sending it, sending the right quality, then I may have to actually put in a claim from you and say, this is the quality I expected and it wasn't sent. And that is why I go back to saying, be as upfront as possible and be as clear as possible about what the buyer can expect from you, okay? The goods must be contained or packaged to preserve and protect the goods. So you need to have the right packaging. You need to protect the goods. Um, so if it's products that um, could easily, you know, so with vegetables, fresh vegetables, it needs to be refrigerated. Okay, um, Some dried fruits and nuts may not necessarily need to be refrigerated, but depending on the different climates and that sort of thing, you'd have to consider it. Um, I mean, in Durban, our humidity is high, our temperatures are high. Yesterday it was 35 degrees. Um, so these are the things we need to think about when we are sending um, goods to another country, you need to actually look at how it needs to be packaged. And as early as possible, please consider sustainable packaging. Because this is becoming a very big thing globally where you need to start looking at your packaging. Um, there's obviously too much of plastic around. Um, so if you're sending me 100 t shirts, you don't necessarily have to package each and every single t shirt within a plastic bag because it's gonna end up in the dump somewhere and in the ocean somewhere, really. Um, so you need to start looking at it as early as possible. What kind of packaging are you going to use for your products and try as much as possible to get biodegradable packaging. Um, and that could actually be one of your selling points for your product that you are offering 
copy, but the packaging it is in is biodegradable or it's reusable or something like that where you can use it as a selling point. Um, because the environment is something that we always need to consider when looking when you're using the packaging. The obligations of the buyer. Yes, it's pretty quite straightforward. Pay the price, really. Um, but paying the price includes taking steps and complying with formalities. So if there's a little credit involved, the buyer needs to make sure that they go to the bank. Um, they need to uh, make sure that they have the available funds because if it's a letter of credit, the bank puts that money aside to make sure that they can pay you. So if I'm buying that 100 T-shirts from you and we have a letter of credit, um, so that $800 or $1,000 when we're considering our transport costs or whatever it is, I need to actually make sure that money is put aside so I can pay you once I've got my documents. So I need to do my steps. I need to make sure I have the money available to pay when I'm supposed to. If you've decided that instead of letter of credit, I need to pay everything in advance, I need to make sure that payment is made. Okay. so. The buyer must take delivery of the goods. Sorry, there is a, a spelling error. So the buyer must take delivery of the goods, meaning I must make myself available to take delivery of goods. I cannot say, OK, deliver today and then I'm not here today. Because every day that the cargo is with a transporter or in a warehouse, that's extra money that needs to be paid, either by myself or you, the seller. So. That is my obligations as the buyer. I need to pay the price as and when required and within the normal formalities that we've arranged. And I must take delivery of the goods and make myself available to take delivery of the goods. Okay. Now, whenever there are international contracts, there's always something that may go wrong. Um, so before you even get into a contract, you need to look at all the things that could go wrong with the product that you are selling to me. Okay, so I may have rights to claim a claim for damages. So if you are sending sending me agricultural products and you have not refrigerated it at the right temperature, then I can claim damages from you. And things as simple as apples need to be refrigerated at specific. Um, Temperature. So apples can range between minus one and one. Okay? Those two degrees in between, they make a difference depending on the type of apple. Um, so I need to make sure that I check when when the goods are delivered, I check it, and then I can actually claim for damages if there's any problems. But specifically agricultural products, meat products that are not processed, you need to refrigerate. Um, if it's fish, it has to be refrigerated, and fish normally is refrigerated at much lower temperatures than meat. Um, so you need to make sure that you are aware of the specific temperatures that it needs to be um, refrigerated at. The specific packaging, no matter what you are selling to me, um, it must you must make sure you're using the right packaging so it doesn't get damaged. Okay, so. If you have sent me, um, you know, those 100 T-shirts and it's not blue, it's black, I may actually request substitute goods from you if they do not conform to the contract. So I may say to you, OK, the T-shirts are black, I cannot sell it, so I'm going to return it and I will actually wait for the blue T-shirts that I requested. So you need to let me know whether or not you can um, substitute the goods and you can make those 100 blue t-shirts. If you cannot, then you will have to um, give me some sort of, I would have to claim damages from you and you would have to make some sort of payment to me for the goods. Um, if we are looking at machinery, I may require you to repair the product um, or I might actually give you extra time for you to perform your obligation. So let's just say you were supposed to deliver on Friday, this Friday, but you do not deliver because there are issues at the border as usual. And you know there's a lot of waiting time at the border. So you can't actually make that delivery on time. So I may actually give you extra time because these are things that happen in international trade. But please remember when you are dealing with a letter of credit, 
there's not that much room to negotiate times and deadlines and that sort of thing. If you don't make a deadline, so if you do not get that cargo moved by a certain date, I am not allowed to give you that extra time. You know, we'd have to go back to the bank and discuss it with the bank, and then there's extra charges for changing the letter of credit and so on. And if I'm really not happy, I might actually terminate the contract. So let's just say I've ordered 100 T-shirts from you, and two weeks later, you haven't even shipped the goods. So I may just decide, okay, I'm terminating the contract. If I haven't made payment, it makes it a lot easier for me to terminate the contract. But if I have made payment of the $800 or $1,000, and you tell me you've started working on the order, I may not actually be able to get all my money back. Um, and then we will start going on a back and forth to see what we can actually, um, how we can remedy the situation. Okay. The seller's rights. Um, so if I, the buyer, um, I don't make my payment, uh, you as a seller, you can claim damages. You can require me to make payment or take delivery. So if you sent the goods, And you've sent the documentation, and I decide I don't want to take delivery because I haven't even paid you yet, and I don't have the money. Okay, you can actually insist that I take delivery because you've performed your obligation. So it's up to me now to perform my obligations. And um, so if I paid you, or let's say I paid fifty percent. I'm going to pay you another but you may pay you the rest of it. So you may actually give me to um, make that payment, or you may decide you want to terminate the contract and um, you want to claim damages for it. Passing of risk. Now, risk is when uh, you really have to worry about your goods being damaged because that is one of the biggest risks. Of moving cargo anyway. And as you can see from the picture, um, this was, I think, an overturned truck. And, you know, there's a whole lot of tomatoes, and literally, you cannot sell the goods. Um, so, passing of risk, loss of, or damage to the goods after the risk has passed to the buyer does not discharge him from its obligation to pay the price unless the loss of damage is due to an act or omission of the seller. Now, if We've used a specific inco term, and the risk has already passed to me. And now the goods have the goods have arrived, and the truck that it's on has an accident. I still need to pay the price for the goods uh, because that is my obligation according to our contract between you, the seller, and me, the buyer. Um, so I cannot get out of paying the price. Unless, of course, you've told me you sent a specific um, product and you haven't sent the right product, then yes, I may decide I don't want to pay the price. Now I might actually be right about it. Okay. Only last week there was a Geneva based company called Mercuria Energy Group. Um, they've ordered 10,000 tons of copper blister from a company in Turkey. Uh, which amounted to about $36 million. And when the cargo started arriving in China, instead of copper, they had painted stones. Uh, so literally, that whole order of $36 million, they've lost all their money. And now they are busy in the courtrooms trying to figure out what went wrong. And where did it go wrong? So was it actually the seller? Was it someone in between um, within the transport? Um, so they're busy investigating. And it seems like the insurance that the um, supplier had provided was fraudulent. So one of the insurance uh, documents was legal. The other three were fraudulent. And these are the kind of things that can go wrong. Not at this level. I mean, this is a very high level when it comes when you're looking at $36 million. Generally, it's a few hundred dollars. You know, our everyday transactions where you've ordered something, let's just say, on online and you haven't received it. 
or it takes two or three months to receive it. Um, that's okay. That's a few hundred dollars, but $36 million and you're looking at a big company that's involved in this. Um, so this could go on for years, really, trying to rectify this. And this is why it's so important to um, have your due diligence done, checking who you're purchasing from, checking who you are selling to. Um, and it's very hard to do it when you are in two different countries. And this is why I like what the USA Trade-Up is doing, because they are dealing with the companies um, and they are trying to link up different companies. So uh, it is hard to figure out what the company is about that you're selling to or buying from. But ultimately, you need to do as much research as possible with who you're dealing with. OK, moving on to Inco terms. Income terms are your international commercial trade terms. So they provide internationally accepted de definitions and rules of interpretation for commercial terms used in contracts for the sale of goods. Okay, now when you're looking at income terms, now we talked earlier about the passing of the risk, right? We talked about payment methods. Um, we talked about documentation. Um, so your Inca terms will actually help you to look at what you as a seller is required to do. When you're looking at the transportation, what do you need to do? What does the buyer need to do when it comes to um, the transportation of the goods? Uh, where does your risk pass? If you are the seller, where are you transporting the goods to? Where is your delivery point? Where is my pickup point? And, you know, um, so there's a lot of back and forth discussions. but. Where Inco terms come in is that they actually make it easier. So we're not going back and forth, you know, yes, this is the address and yes, risk will pass here. But just using the Inco term, we already know risk will pass at this point. Um, I'm responsible for this part of the insurance. You are responsible for that part of insurance. Um, you are responsible for those documents. Um, so all of those things, we don't even really need to have in-depth discussion because we both should understand, you know, by using a specific INCO term, what we are both responsible for. And when selecting the INCO term, uh, buyers and sellers need to consider the following. Uh, you need to consider how much of experience do you have with international trade? Um, because at the end of the day, if you are using a specific INCO term, you really need to understand what your responsibilities are. How much of the cost will you be paying? How much of the transport will you be responsible for? How much of the insurance you'll be responsible for? And up to what point? Um, you need to know the risk associated with each income term. How much responsibilities is it giving you? Um, the cost and the financial responsibility. Remember, if you are involved with the transport side, side as well, you will have to be making payments to the transporters, whether it is to transport the goods or to help you um, clear the goods at customs. Um, and every step of the way, if anything goes wrong, you'll have to make payments. Um, so you really need to think about, you know, what kind of experience do you have handling the transport operators um, and supplies for international shipments? Do you have relationships with logistics companies? Um, so my advice is when you are looking at which income term to use, you also need to look at who your buyer is, how much of experience they have as well. And sometimes you could actually rather give them more responsibility because they know how to deal with things. So if it's a South African company, that's a big company and that's always importing, they will already have their own transporters and they would say, okay, well, I will pick up the goods from your warehouse. And there's no harm in doing that, really, because that as a seller that gives you less responsibility, all you have to do is literally just prepare the documents and make sure that the goods are ready at a specific time um, and you're delivering, even if it is in your warehouse, you still have to have it at a specific spot and ready at a specific time for the transporters to pick up. And you may, um, depending on the income term, may have to help load the goods onto the truck or whatever transport that is chosen. So you really, that's why you need to understand in good terms. You need to know exactly what you need to do and your, the part that you need to play. 
So income terms um, are updated every 10 years. Um, so we, most people would be familiar with income terms 2010, uh, income terms 2000, and now income terms 2020 has been launched earlier this year. Um, but we'll go through both income terms 2010 and 2020 now. Um, ultimately, your INCO term is this, your XW, EXW, your FCA, CPT, CIP, DAT, DAP, and DDP. Um, and moving on to your FAS, FOB, CFR, and CIF. Now, when you first learn about INCO terms, it's literally Greek to all of us, including myself. I, I had to learn it a few times to really get it. Um, so your X works. So your EXW stands for X works. Your FCA stands for free carrier. Then you've got CPT, carrier paid to. CIP, carriage and insurance paid to. DAT is your delivered at terminal and DAP delivered at place. DDP is delivered duty paid. Okay. Now here you've got your little arrow. Okay, so your blue arrow actually tells you where your risk and costs and your transport actually um, go hand over to the buyer. So here you are the seller. Okay, so at this point you've got the seller and here you've got your buyer. And on the red warehouse is the buyer and the blue warehouse is the seller. So whatever that arrow is, that is where your risk passes. So here your X works is literally at the seller's warehouse. That is where your risk passes. Okay, so from that point, so the buyer comes to your warehouse or they get their transporter to come to your, your warehouse and pick up the goods um, and they will handle the cost and the risk from there. So their insurance costs start from the moment they pick up the goods at your warehouse, right? So free carrier, which is the next one, so this could be at any point here, right? So free carrier is when it's loaded onto your first carrier. So your first carrier could be a truck, it could be a um, train, it could be a ship. Um, so it, it could be an airplane, whatever mode of transport you have picked, it, it could be that, right? So up until it gets to that first carrier, you, the seller, you're responsible for the transport, you're responsible for the risk, and you're responsible for all the costs that it entails to get it to the first carrier. So if it means getting a truck to get it to the airport, you will need to pay for it, and you will need to pay for the insurance up until that point, um, and you will actually have to pay for any other things. Make sure that you've got all the right documents in place to move that cargo. From the moment that it's on that it's at the first carrier, whether it's in the warehouse or whatever point you have stipulated with the buyer, um, then it's the buyer's responsibility. Okay, then you've got carriage paid to. Okay, so here you are uh, as a seller, you're paying till the first carrier, but here you are paying the cost up until delivery in their country. So this is why it's important because not everything's as straightforward as X works and free carrier, okay? In some cases, yes, you're paying the cost, but in other cases, um, you know, you're not paying the cost right up until delivery. Um, or you may have to pay insurance uh, up until delivery. So all of these change depending on the income term that you're using. Carriage and insurance paid to, so here you are paying for insurance to delivery, but that risk still passes at the first carrier. So that's where things start to get complicated, where you're paying for something such as the insurance. So you may buy insurance on my behalf because I'm not in Zambia to get the insurance. So you may say, okay, we use CIP and I'll pay for the insurance. So ultimately I'm paying you to get my insurance, but I don't know what kind of insurance you're getting. Um, so that is another risk that I'm taking, but it's not your risk. It's my risk from the time it gets to the transporter. 
And that is where Inca terms get a bit complicated um, and a bit hard to use. But ultimately, we need to try and simplify it as much as possible. So if you don't fully understand Inca terms, you do whatever Inca term you do understand and where you know you can cover the responsibility of it. Delivered at terminal, this is a terminal at destination. So it would be any terminal within South Africa that I may specify, or it could be a warehouse just past the border, and I'll say, okay, deliver it there. So you will pay for the insurance and all the costs um, that entails up until delivered at that terminal. Delivered at place, this could be another warehouse or one of my cases of business. Um, so all of these things you need to actually look at. If you are the seller, do you have the money that it takes to deliver it? Can you pay for the insurance? Do you really want the risk of it? And DDP is if I'm inexperienced as a buyer. So let's just say I don't have any experience importing and clearing goods. So what you'll do is you take on all the cost, all the risk and the transport obligations until it gets to my warehouse. And for me, that's the least responsibility. OK, and the opposite was experts where I take on all the risk. So, and then you've got rules for sea and inland waterway, and this is where you have your ships involved. Um, so this will be free alongside ship, uh, FOB, free on board. And FOB is quite common um, because even with your customs, you know, your customs calculation is done FOB, free on board. Um, and that's going from way back uh, because um, since Inca terms 2010, FOB was specifically for C. Okay, so, but it is when it gets onto the first carrier. Um, free alongside ship is when it's at the port. FOB is when it's literally on the vessel. Okay, CFR is cost and freight is on the vessel, similar to FOB, but in this case, you are actually paying the freight in advance um, to help me because maybe you have a better buying power with the um, shipping companies. CIF is where your transport stops at the vessel. I choose the vessel that I want it on. You pay the insurance and the insurance on my behalf as well. And you also pay the freight costs. Um, so these CIF and CFR will be a little more complicated, but FAS and FOB are much simpler. So if you are using ships and you are not very experienced, you can use FAS or FOB. But if I and if I'm um, not experienced, we can still use any of the other in Kutan. So we can still use XWorks, we can still use CPT, FCA. Um, all of these can be used for any transport. But these are specifically only for sea and inland waterway. Okay, moving on to Inca terms 2020, there hasn't been that many changes. Okay, so you still have your X works, um, which is the same. Um, nothing has changed. You've got free carrier, you've got carriage insurance paid to delivered at place. Um, delivered at place unloaded and which is similar to delivered at place but here you're literally unloading it for you for me okay but you are not paying the duties here with ddp you are also doing the clearing for me okay and then carriage at pay two which is similar to the previous incoderms 2010 Okay, and now you move on to your rules for sea and inland waterway. Your FPS be alongside ship, FOB fee on board, um, cost and freight, um, which is similar to what it was for 2010, and CIF. So there hasn't been that much changes. They've just removed one or two um, that were not really, you know, they just wanted to get rid of a couple of inco terms and change a couple. Okay, um, what I have 
done is updated the input terms on an Excel sheet, which I'll show you once we are done with this uh, presentation, um, where it will be easy, where you just choose the input term on that Excel sheet, and it'll tell you exactly as a seller what you're responsible for and as a buyer what I'm responsible for. Okay, moving on to payment methods. Okay, so we ultimately have four payment methods. Okay, you've got cash in advance, which is me paying in advance when I order, and to confirm that order, I will pay the $800 or $1,000 or whatever you've quoted me and sent me um, on my invoice. Uh, so you do not have to wait for payment once the delivery has been made. Now, ultimately, um, for me, the buyer, this is very risky because I could pay the money and I could maybe I will not get that goods that I've ordered. Okay, and this is why it's so important to have insurance because I could make that payment, and the payments are not as low as eight hundred dollars normally. It's eight thousand dollars, eighty thousand dollars, and here I mean with the example from the Geneva company, it was thirty six million dollars. So. I need to make sure that I've got the correct insurance in place so that if anything goes wrong and I've already made the payment, um, I have a way to try and get my money back. Okay, so cash in advance is pretty straightforward. It's me, the buyer, paying in advance. And this is common when you're buying um, these days because um, a lot of sellers do not want to sell to people who um, are not ready to pay and with good reason, obviously, because you do not want to put all that effort um, and spend all that money and not get paid. Okay, Letters of credit. Now, this is the most um, risk averse payment method, really. So letters of credit is where you get your banks involved and my bank involved. So we decide we want to use a letter of credit. You go to your bank and you say, OK, I want to open a letter of credit, and this is the buyer in South Africa, and this is the buyer's bank. So if I'm banking with Standard Bank, your bank in Zambia will have to contact Standard Bank, right? And say to Standard Bank, okay, I've got my client here who says they want to open a letter of credit, and this is a client of yours in South Africa. Uh, can you please confirm this with your client? So Standard Bank will call me and say, okay, this is, um, you know, do you want to open a letter of credit? And this is the seller in Zambia. So I'll say, I agree. Um, and then you and I will decide, okay, this is the goods that um, I'm buying from you and at this price, right? So let's just say it is $80,000. What Standard Bank will do is that they will take that $80,000 out of my bank account and they will keep it in a secure account that where I don't have any access to it, right? So they will make sure that that money is ready to pay you as a seller, okay? Or pay your bank, really, your bank in Zambia. Uh, now, letters of credit are dependent on the documents, okay? So you will have to provide a packing list, you'll have to provide a commercial invoice, you'll have to provide a transport document and any other documents that may be your uh, certificate of origin and they cannot be a single error not even a typo on your documents because when it comes to letters of credit the bank doesn't look at whether or not you've literally physically sent the cargo they only look at the documents that you have provided so if you have provided a transport bill of lading that is what they're looking at. So they're going to look at the bill of lading. They're going to look at your, and they will state what documents that they need. The bill of lading, the packing list, the commercial invoice, your certificate of origin, and, and all those documents have to tie in with what is stated on the letter of credit. So we said, I'm ordering a thousand t-shirts. That is exactly what needs to be stated on the bill of lading the transport documentation and that's exactly what needs to be stated on the commercial invoice and the packing list. Um, so what happens is you decide to pack the goods and you get your transporter to pick it up. They issue you, issue you with your transport bill of lading. So you take all your documents, 
to the bank. So the bank will check it and they have their own set of rules and letters of credit are covered by the UCP 600, which we won't go into detail with, but they have a standard way of how to check the documents and what to look for. So they will check the documents. If they are happy with the documents, they will send it to Standard Bank and say, these are the documents, please make payment. If they're not happy with the documents, they'll send it back to you and say, you need to change the documents, okay? So whether or not you've shipped the goods or not, if those documents are not correct, you will not get that payment. So if you need to make corrections, yes, you'll do it, and then you'll send it back to the bank. Then they will check it again. Once they've approved it, then only will they send it to Standard Bank. Standard Bank will check it themselves again. If they are happy with the document, then they will make payment to your bank in Zambia, and your bank in Zambia will make payment to you. In the meantime, Standard Bank will issue me with the document so I can do my clearing in South Africa. That is how letters of credit work. So with letters of credit, the bank undertakes to make that payment and to be involved. And that obviously would come at a cost. And those costs, you can actually go and visit your bank and say, if I need to open a letter of credit, what are these costs? Documentary collections are similar to letters of credit, but the bank doesn't take any responsibility to uh, get the payment for you. So your bank won't take any responsibility in this. My bank won't take any responsibility with this. It may be a bit helpful because um, your bank can verify whether I, my business exists with the bank and so on. Um, so there's not as many costs as things, but it's a little risky. The last payment is an open account. And this is usually for companies that are part of a bigger um, group. So it's in-house accounts. So Toyota in South Africa has a branch in Zambia or in Malawi or in any other, con other countries, um, and they want to get some of the parts from there, then they would actually have an open account. Or if ShopRite or uh, MassMart has branches elsewhere, they have their own open accounts with each other. Okay, so open accounts are not for new business and it's not for um, entrepreneurs or this and these are for the big companies. Okay, so those are the different types of payment methods. So we've been through the contracts, how you set up your contract, um, the Inca terms and your payment methods. Um, I just want to change this to the um, Inca terms, which I've done. Okay. So here, what we've done is I've created an Excel sheet. So those 2010 and 2020 Inco terms that you saw in the presentation, um, I've gone through the Inco term books. I've uh, picked up all the main ideas that you need to know as buyers and sellers. Um, so if you want to use a specific Inca term, you just go into the Excel sheet and you decide what you want to use. OK, so let's just say you want to use free carrier. So you've got free carrier 2010 or 2020. So you can use either one. The uh, rules haven't changed. When you are stating it, you say uh, you are stating the FCA and your place of delivery. So if the place of delivery is a warehouse in Zambia, that is what you need to do. You need to be as specific as possible, okay? So you'll say FCA, a specific warehouse, the address, and in good terms, 2010. Okay, so the delivery is to the carrier or person nominated by the buyer at the agreed point. So I may nominate a carrier or transport company. Okay, the cost, you the seller, you're responsible for all costs up until delivery. You must pay the cost of those check operations and packaging that are necessary for the purpose of delivering. So you need to make sure that it's packaged and it's ready for delivery. Okay, and where applicable, you may be responsible for export clearance. The documents that you need to provide are any 
licenses for export. So if you need um, your certificate of origin, your phytosanitary, then you've got to provide your commercial invoice, your packing list and export customs clearance where required and your transport document, right? Your risk passes at place of delivery at the agreed time. Okay, so you, the seller, you will require insurance up until delivery and me, the buyer, from the point of delivery, I will need to, um, you know, have my insurance ready. Okay, so if you look at X Works, okay, so also similar to 2020, you'll just write EXW, um, your warehouse address, where I'll be picking up the goods. So your place of delivery is the seller's premises, your named place, agreed time, and the fact that it won't be loaded. So wherever I get to be the transporter, they need to be responsible for loading, or the loading really is the buyer's responsibility, right? Which is me. Okay, so you are responsible for all cost up until it is at my disposal at your warehouse. So you will have a section up in your warehouse where you will have the goods ready. So you would have checked it, you would have made sure that the quality, you're measuring, weighing, whatever it is, um, it's packaged properly um, and just ready for transportation really. My responsibility is for all the costs, including insurance, from the moment it's loaded on the truck for transport, and any other cost right up until it comes to me in my warehouse in South Africa. So literally you as a seller, you just need to get your goods ready and package properly. Okay, but you also need to make sure that you are providing all the same documents that you would need and I would need. So it would be a certificate of origin, your fighters, your commercial invoice, your packing list and transfer document. And risk passes at the delivery at the agreed time um, and I will have to have insurance from this point. So as you can see, the Excel sheet actually makes it a lot easier. So if you are busy quoting somebody, you need to know what cost you are responsible for because these are the costs you will add on to your um, uh, quote. So the transport cost, your insurance cost, these are all costs that you need to um, add on to your final price. Okay, so that is the income terms and what you can do with it. Um, and that will be available with the toolkit when it is um, submitted online. Um, so which should be um, soon, uh, we're still finalizing it. Um, so if you've had any questions or if you have any questions now, please submit it on the chat. Um, so thank you. Francis, back to you. Thanks very much, Mary, and thank you so much for all the valuable, invaluable information. Um, I think the spreadsheet is in hot demand already, so uh, thanks for already saying that it will be shared as soon as it's finalized and ready for sharing. Um, so we've got a couple of questions that have come in already. Please feel free to pose more questions in the chat box for Mary or one of the USA Trade Up team to answer. So the first question that we have is, is there an alternative way to have a long term documented relationship with an overseas customer without forming a legal agreement? I don't know if we need the person to give a bit more clarity on the question. If, uh, I think yes, if you can provide more clarity, uh, because ultimately, you know, we do form long term relationships and you know, but they may be as uh, different contracts for different orders or we could have a distribution agreement where if I'm in South Africa and I like your product and I want to distribute it here in South Africa, then I could be your agent here and that would obviously be a long term contract. Uh, but it's very hard if you want a long term relationship, it's very hard to get away from a long term contract, really. Um, and obviously you would want a long term contract um, if it's somebody who really likes a product, who has the context to sell your product easily. Great, thank you. Um, whoever posed that question, does anyone, uh, does that answer your question? Mm 
I'm just seeing who asked that. Uh, Mania, please could you put your camera on and uh, come onto the screen and you can unmute and m there we go. Our other guest has disappeared from the call. Mania? Okay, thank you, Mary. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. All right, thank you so much for the lovely presentation. Uh, my question isn't so much related to today's presentation. My apologies about that. But I really want to know what are the available uh, platforms that people who think they may be export ready can use to search who are the buyers and in what specification and what specifications do they want before we can approach the US uh, aid hub for, for assistance. What are the you know easy platforms that one can use to search who is there looking for what in what specifications? <laughs> Thank you for your question, Manu. One of the Thank platforms you. that I've come across um, while doing the research for this was tradekey.com. So it's T-R-A-D-E K-E-Y.com. T-R-A-D-E-K-E-Y.com. Um, so what TradeKey does is you can actually go on and register. And obviously with the country that you're from, the product that you're selling, and there's also buyers that's registered. So you can advertise your products on there and see if there are any takers. So there will be buyers from South Africa. Um, so, and you would be able to see other people's prices um, for similar products. The other thing, if you want to actually know what the competitors are selling it at, and especially China, then I suggest you go and do a search for the same product that you have on Alibaba.com um, or exportersindia.com. Um, so you can just Google these uh, different websites and have a look at them so you have an idea of you know, what the competitive prices are. Because a lot of the times, um, African companies are uh, literally competing with China. Um, so it's good to have their prices and the best way to do it is by going on to alibaba.com. Uh, but tradekey.com is a different platform that I found. Um, honestly, I don't know a lot about it, but it's a platform that you can register as a seller um, and buyers are on there as well and they can actually look at your products and you can start relationships on there. How to verify the uh, buys is a bit hard and the good thing is you know you've got the USAID trade hub here and maybe they can help out um, when linking up with different companies um, but that's the main uh, platform that I've come across. Thanks Mary. Um, from a USA trade hub point of view uh, we can also give you some uh, some other options um, that that we've been working on. So I think it would be important to understand a lot of the platforms that we've seen are focused on a very specific product or specific market. So for example, we've assisted some organic certified companies to register on the Organic Traders Association in the US. You have to be NOP uh, certified to, um, to register with them uh, or list with them. Um, then we also have been working very closely with the African Trade Platform, which was developed um, for USA Trade Hub to link suppliers and buyers and trade financiers in the region. Um, and we're very keen to support companies to register on there. Uh, what's great about ATP is that they also vet the companies before they are allowed to load on the system. So you can't just get onto the system without being vetted both as a buyer and as a supplier. So please talk to your country rep if you're interested in that. Um, and then we'll also uh, have an opportunity to list companies that have ingredients or that manufacture ingredients for food or cosmetics uh, on the Informa Markets portal, which is uh, a US focused portal that we are working on. So they're actually quite, they, it's one of the key activities in our work plan is to help companies to, to list on different e-commerce platforms. So please reach out to us if that's something you are pursuing. Um, great, we've got lots of activity going on in the chat there. Let me look for another question. Um, Clifford, I saw that you were the person who asked our first question and thank you for confirming that you've been answered. Do you have thanks thanks so much? Of... <laughs> thanks, Mino. <Mineo. laughs> I hope I'm saying your name correctly. Um, okay, then we've got something. Do you have 
a buyer database for specific goods. I think uh, Mr. Nguni, and we've probably covered that uh, in my earlier answer. And I would also say again to please reach out to your your country representative um, because as the USA Trade Hub, as much as we have a database of buyers, what we prefer to do is to assist with the matching and the link to make sure that we're linking you with a, a suitable buyer that you know we where you've got the right capacity they're looking for somebody with your business model or your products or your specific level of certification so we we go beyond um the database so please again reach out to your your country rep um mary we've got lots of questions about how we must have your spreadsheet and we need your spreadsheet now so <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd appreciate to finalize that and get it out to everyone. So thank you. It's great to, to hear the positive feedback and we will we will act on that. Um, then there's a question here about is the recording um, for part one of this webinar available? Uh, it's not on our website quite yet. It's just being edited and it will be up soon. Um, so please keep in communication with us on that. If you if you don't get it in the next couple of days, it should be ready very, very soon. Yes. Do we have other questions? Please put up your hand if you want to pose a question uh, live. I think the spreadsheet solves all problems. There's no questions anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought I'd confuse them first with the presentation and then show them the easy way. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Thank you. OK, Frank is saying something. Frank, please come on stage. I've got one question from Frank. Uh, hi, Francis. Sorry. Please introduce yourself, Frank. Yeah. Um, oh, OK, so Stephen here. I just wanted to check if uh, we possibly can get um, a way in, in where we can trace the companies that need to make application following up to what, what has been presented in terms of the spreadsheet. I'm sorry, Frank, what was that? OK, um, I was asking about the spreadsheet that uh, that you just presented. Um, we just want to know in terms of which participants will be interested in the tool and, um, you know, possibly maybe be able in a position to trace their name, country and the business area and what they're planning to use uh, to use it for. I think this is more generally to the participants. OK, thanks, okay. Frank. I think based on the registrations that we received and, and all of that and the fact that we can save this chat, we will be able to to track that and make sure that people who have requested the sheet will will get it. So thank you very much for that suggestion. Sally, I see your hand is up. My apologies. I did not see that initially. Um, no, uh, Francis, I just wanted to mention that the, the recording, the webinar recording for the toolkit one uh, is actually up and I've just shared it. So you'll be able to access it. Super, thank you. Sally um, is our communications director at the USA Trade Hub. So this is coming from the source, hot of the press. Thank you, Sally. And Frank is our monitoring evaluation and learning specialist. So he was making sure we have the data we need to follow up on, on our assistance. Do we have any other questions? Is the toolkit going to be mandatory? for all trading with South Africa and the USA. If you have been trading with South Africa, for example, can you continue as normal or do you need to use the toolkit? Um, OK, so I'm asking because I've never come across INCO terms, even though we trade with South Africa. Uh, Mary, do you want to answer that question? Look, if you've been trading and it's been working well, I'd say continue. But uh, look, Incoterms does make it easier to deal with risk and if anything goes wrong. So the basis of this presentation was anticipating anything that could go wrong with the contracts. And that's where Incoterms comes in and that's where your insurance comes in. Um, if you're happy to continue the way out, that's great. Um, but it is something to consider because at any point, you know, you could have unnecessary de 
delays, uh, trucks have had accidents. I mean, we've had tons of, you know, DHL trucks missing documents and that sort of thing. So these things happen. This is normal. Um, so that is why I focused on it. And a lot of the participants today are new business and new entrants into exports. So the idea was to give them the right processes to follow from the beginning. Uh, so, you know, as they go along, they know that they are following the right processes and not learning from expensive mistakes. But really, mm -hmm. if you are happy to continue as is, that's fine. Mary, I think those are really good points. I think the toolkit is really there to try and like reduce the, the school fees you have to pay if you haven't done it before. <laughs> um, but even if you're an experienced exporter, if you have a new buyer, you might need to um, use INCO terms. <clears throat> and I think as Mary highlighted, there are risks associated with not understanding um, terms that maybe a new buyer would, would uh, offer. So I think that could be of assistance, but you don't have to use the toolkit. It's really something that is being developed to assist companies who are new to, to the trade game. Okay, we have a few questions coming in and we had a hand, but I see it's disappeared. I help describe. Um, I'm, our system's failing us here. <laughs> so there was a follow up from Chipo. I appreciate your answer, Mary. So I guess the next question is, do I have to be a member of ICC or something in order to use the toolkit? No, this is for anyone who uh, literally can go into the Sati Hub website once we've uh, published the toolkit. Um, so anyone can use Incoterms and you can also, I'm sorry I didn't mention this before, but uh, Incoterms can be used for uh, domestic, um, well, trade as well. So even if you are within Zambia and you are trading within Zambia, you can still use it or whichever country you're in. Um, so there's no need for fees or membership to anything. It's just understanding it and how you use it. I think maybe just to um, come back to you know the earlier points that, that George raised, and I see he has his hand up. Um, so I know a few people came in late. So just to reiterate, the USA Trade Hub is a USA funded program. It's a six year program that runs until September. And our role, particularly if I focus in on, on today's session, uh, is about supporting companies from seven countries that we work in in the region on how to import into South Africa. And this toolkit basically is a document which, which helps um, newer exporters or less experienced exporters to understand what the requirements are to import into South Africa and which helps you to navigate that process. It's available to um, any clients that we support. We do what we ask in return for the support we offer is um, reports. We need to report to USAID on the good work that we do. So on a quarterly basis, if you have exports to South Africa, we ask you to share those uh, that information with us so that we can also share that with our funder. Um, and also then to participate in an annual survey so that we can uh, understand whether the work we're doing is impactful and how we can improve. So the, this information is available to the, the companies we work with and we will just ask for some data in return um, for access to these tools and for access to facilitation services that we offer. Um, I think what is important to emphasize is the companies that we work with should be close to export ready we um, we focus on companies that are able to supply um, the South African market or are very close to being able to supply the market. It would, we wouldn't be able to help all businesses. So if you're a startup and you haven't got an established business in your own country, it would be very difficult to fall within the scope of our program. So just to reiterate, we're really working with export companies that are um, close to ready. We have a few more questions coming in. So uh, is it best to find a combination of a distributor importer or is it best to have a separate distributor and a separate importer? In your opinion, which is most ideal? Um, I, I think with a with any person in between you and the final buyer, you are adding um, costs to your final buyer. 
because every agent at some point will take their cut from that final sale. But at the same time, you may need someone to distribute your goods who understands the local market. So it depends on the type of uh, product you have. And I think that's where you can actually speak to the USA Trade Hub and they are communicating with importers and investors and they'd be the best people to help you with that um, to see what you should be doing. But ultimately, it it does depend on the product and how much you have been exporting so far. Um, so it, it really is on a case by case basis and your experience, um, the importer's experience and so on. Mm, thanks, Mary. I think that's very crucial. I think it's quite specific to to the business as well in terms of your capability and uh, your experience. So I think that would be something you could pick up. It also depends a lot on the market. We see, for example, in the US versus South Africa, the market structure is different, so it will it will depend quite a lot depending on, on how the market um, works. Then we have a question on how do we find out about all the certifications necessary to export a certain product to the US or South Africa? I think on that one, please reach out to your country rep. We can give some guidance on that, depending on, again, on your product, um, if it's food, uh, we normally recommend one of the MyGFSI uh, related certifications. I think the sort of standard on that is probably FSSC 22000, but there's different for different products and different uh, lines. You'll need to have um, different guidance. So please reach out to your country rep for guidance on that. Okay, then we've got, I think, what time for one? I think, Francis, sorry, um, just on that question, uh, they can actually go back and watch the first webinar because we did cover some of the commodities and what the requirements are. And I do have another Excel sheet that will be published, and that's for the commodities that USA Trade Up has been focusing on. Uh, so that will tell you exactly the types of uh, licenses you'll need to import into South Africa and um, the type of inspections the cargo will go through. Mm, that's great. Thanks, Mary. And then I think the other useful resource on US specifically, um, there's a webinar that was done around foreign supplier verification programs and the kind of um, uh, steps that are required for US um, entry uh, and for food products. So I think look out for that also. We'll share the, the resource uh, at the end of this session. Okay, then we have a question on quality issues may be contentious. How best can exporters ensure that there's no misunderstanding with buyers in South Africa? <laughs> Look, it really depends on the product um, and what you're offering. And, you know, if you are sending them a sample and they're happy with the sample, the product that you finally send them has to be in line um, and not, you know, or better, really. Uh, but you cannot send a lower quality product and expect, you know, any business to be happy with it. So rather just send a small sample so they are aware of the type of qualities and if they need to do any testing locally, they can do it um, and they'll know whether or not they're happy with it. But obviously you need to know, you know, international standards for your specific product and what the requirements are. And these you can just, you know, do your online search or you can speak to the USA Trade Up representative in your country as well and they'd be able to assist. I think on this, um, also, if there is a dispute, it would be useful to already have um, a clause in your agreement or an understanding about how you would resolve that. So if you send a sample and then your ultimate order, the protein levels are but less or the beans aren't dry enough and there's a cost incurred for the buyer to have to dry the beans, there should already be a mechanism for resolving mm -hmm. disputes that you've agreed up front um, so that if things go wrong, you can quickly, you know, resort to an amicable mechanism for, for resolving the issue. Okay, um, George, I have a question which I think you, if you don't mind, please will you answer this one? Uh, noted that Zimbabwe shows as a hole in the map of the USA Trade Hub uh, targeted countries. Uh, is any work being done to include Zimbabwe in the USAID trade hub? 
uh, mandate? Well, that's um, <laughs> the question is, uh, um, I think, twofold there. Uh, uh, when, when I mentioned earlier that uh, we cover eight countries, what I didn't say is um, <clears throat> yes, when the project started, or the project itself is approved to work in 11 countries, uh, although we are currently working in eight of the 11, uh, and the other three countries, in addition to the eight we are working in, um, for your interest, Zimbabwe, Angola, and DRC. Now, how we operate is that uh, we have to get uh, USAID mandate to uh, be able to work in uh, those other extra, well, all the countries that we work in. And to answer your question specifically on Zimbabwe, we are currently not having, or we don't have any activities in Zimbabwe at the moment, because we have not been uh, approved to work in Zimbabwe uh, specifically, although the project covers uh, those eight, uh, 11 countries. Um, whether we are planning on working in Zimbabwe uh, I can say that uh, at the moment uh, we haven't been given that indication by USAID uh, on whether we will be working in Zimbabwe anytime soon. While, while I'm still, uh, I still have this stage, uh, or I'm still on the stage, I just wanted to point out that um, please note that the work that we do is normally demand driven. Uh, by that I mean all the uh, webinars, all the documentation and all the activities that we end up doing, we do uh, that in response to a request from one of you. Um, so, for example, this particular webinar came about because uh, we had a lot of requests on uh, from people or firms saying they would want to understand better how they can trade with South Africa. And, and then we had to come up with a tool that can help with that. And these tools that we come up with are not uh, mandatory. They are voluntary. Uh, if they are a, may, mainly aimed at assisting those that would want to use them. Let me uh, hasten to add that uh, whether you sign a document or not, you have a contract. Uh, that's how it works. So uh, you might not have signed anything by anybody or uh, with anybody, but uh, uh, you have a contract. And you, once you have agreed with somebody, you have to deliver according to your agreement. And although it might be difficult to fight that in court or prove that anyway, uh, you will still be bound by the uh, contract that you have uh, gone into. I'm, ask, I'm saying this specifically uh, in response to the question earlier that uh, somebody said we are trading in South Africa, but we don't uh, use ecoterms. You are using ecoterms in the sense that we have agreed to a contract with somebody to do certain things, though you don't know it or you have not been told. Uh, so it's important to know, and you can actually go back now and look at uh, what contract you have signed. You might actually find that what uh, Mary has been saying and talking about here will give you more insight into what you have uh, signed off uh, on. Uh, thank you. Thank you, George. I think that's very important. I also have a question here, which I think is important, uh, especially given the role of facilitators in this process. So the question is on the issue of contracts and obligations. To what extent do trade pr promotion organizations or business membership organizations come to assist when there's a contractual dispute between the seller and the buyer? This is more so when the seller and buyer were linked through a trade promotion program. Um, so I think this is a really important point I, which I would want to emphasize from our perspective as USA Trade Hub. In every engagement that we have, we emphasize the point that it is a business risk and decision between the buyer and seller. Uh, and th that is crucial. Um, as much as we aid the facilitation of that linkage, um, it is the obligation of the buyer and the seller at the end of the day to reach terms that are agreeable, understand how to resolve disputes, because ultimately the buck stops with the buyer and the seller. Um, so I think that's a very important question. I don't know, Mary, if you want to add to that outside of the context. Um, 
specifically? Yes, I agree fully, uh, Francis, because ultimately your contract is only between the buyer and seller. It has nothing to do with the transporter. It has nothing to do with any other carriers. It has nothing to do with any other business, whether it is uh, USA Trade Up that helped all get together. Um, ultimately, you have your obligations as a seller, you have your obligations as a buyer, and you have your remedies in place. So that is where you, as the buyer and seller, you'll that's where you come together and you decide exactly what your contract would entail. Because and that is why you need insurance and you have to be using the correct inco terms and understand why you're using those inco terms um, and why you need to have your insurance because no other party can actually be involved in this. So if you are sitting in court, USA Trade Up is not there, nor are there any other business um, organizations that can assist you. Um, so the responsibility fully lies with the buyer and the seller. Thank you, Mary. One last question, and then I think we can be close to wrapping up. Um, there's a question, is it easier to register my business in both countries? So to have a business, say, in Mozambique and in South Africa? To register a business in South Africa, you need to be physically in South Africa. And you have to have your premises, and obviously you would have to have your uh, probably a work visa. So if you're not a South African citizen, there might be an issue with you registering a business in South Africa, unless you may have a local partner. Um, I'm not sure how it is supposed to assist you because um, you could be doing business with South Africans without having a company here. Uh, but when it comes to expanding into a different country, um, so if you have your business in Mozambique and then you want to move your business into South Africa, um, that's a whole different ball game, to be honest. Um, so then you've got to do your assessments like your pest bowls and you know, assessing the politics, economics and all of that um, and knowing exactly what you intend to do with the business. And remember, if you want to open a business in South Africa, you need to follow South African rules. So our labor law is very strict. Um, most of our laws are strict. Um, you're going to have to be paying tax here and registered for tax. Um, so it, it, there's a lot that it entails and which is beyond the scope of this webinar. Um, but it's, I wouldn't actually advise it if you're not already, uh, if you don't already have a distribution here in South Africa, if you don't already have um, customers here in South Africa. You need to have something here or specific business or in making enough money out of the South African market for you to want to be based here. Because it's costly, you know, opening up a different branch, uh, it's all different costs as well. Okay, thanks, Mary. Um, I see a hand from Reginaldo. Let's take one question from him and then I'm going to hand, I'm going to wrap up. So Reginaldo, last question from you. Please just introduce yourself, keep it brief. Uh, you're on mute. OK, I'm sorry, but we don't seem to hear you. Um, so with that, I would like to say a huge thank you again to Mary for educating us uh, again, as you did last week. It's been it's really interesting understanding these uh, inco terms and contracting and finance in more detail. Um, I know that there's great interest in receiving these tools, so thank you for your work and contribution to uh, the mission and mandate of the USA Trade Hub. I would like to now hand over to my colleague Tsipiso Tefo. Um, Mabatu, if you can just bring up our slides for us. Tsipiso is the program assistant for the South African cluster. He's been with the USA Trade Hub since August 2019 and he is going to just close it for us and finalize the next steps. Thanks very much. Um, thank you, Francis, and thank you very much, uh, Mary, for the insightful discussions. Uh, just to go through the next steps after this webinar, uh, the toolkit is currently being finalized as communicated by my colleagues and will be shared on satihub.com once available. So please be on the lookout on that uh, web page for resources to increase to, to assist your export to South Africa. And um, 
just uh, moving forward with regards to previous webinar presentations, I heard there were questions about FSVP and other related uh, 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 toolkit and regional trading webinars that we've had. The links have been shared by our communications director on the chat box. Just follow the links and then in the resources page, you'll be able to find a list of previous webinars that's been held by the USA Trade Hub. Um, future webinars that will be held. Include the following. Uh, we have the specialty food live marketing and branding feedback session on March 24th. And then after that, we have the regional learning event in collaboration with the Eastern Cape uh, Development Corporation. Uh, and Corporation. we also yeah. have the financial services provider workshop to reflect and pave a sustainable way forward on March the 31st. Uh, as previously communicated again, for access to services, technical assistance by the USA Trade Hub, and information on resources and direction on where to find our presentations, please contact our country reps in your respective countries uh, as they are displayed um, on the screen right now. Thank you very much everybody for your participation in the USA Trade Hub workshops. Have a brilliant day ahead and week ahead. Thank you.